Hi everyone. We are pleased to announce the launching of the audiobook Projections of the Consciousness, a compilation of 60 lucid out-of-body experiences experienced by Dr. Valdo Vieira, who proposed the neosciences, consensiology and projectiology. In this book, the author shares a wide range of experiences, uh, including experiences with deceased consciousnesses or spirits, experiences in different dimensions, and even a cosmic projection. This is the first time that an audiobook will be available in English, giving a greater number of people access to this classic book. We hope that this will be the first of many others to come. We would also like to invite you to visit CIACI, or the Centre for Higher Studies of Consentiology, and the other institutions located here, which are linked to evolutionary development. At CIACI, you have the opportunity to study and deepen your self-knowledge, as well as to deepen your potential for achieving integral awareness, uh, enabling you to interact in several dimensions. It is important to emphasise that we do not use any types of drugs in our research, nor do we depend on any gurus. Rather, you will study uh, your own evolutionary level and you will find out more about yourself. Within this institution, there are a number of facilities which will help to further your evolutionary development, including The Holocycle is a research facility which contains various dictionaries, support materials and books for you to deepen your studies. Attached to the Holocycle is an extensive library with a large collection of books and several exhibitions of knowledge artefacts. The Tertullarium is an amphitheatre with circular architecture where entries for the Encyclopedia of Consentiology are presented daily and are transmitted live on YouTube. It is only available in Portuguese. However, you can find a selection of translated entries in English on the Tertullarium YouTube channel. There are 16 laboratories of which each one has a specific theme for you to perform personal research. In these spaces, you can get in touch with the extra physical team of helpers to help you experience the various topics studied here, such as perceiving and measuring your bioenergetic signals, deepening your research about past lives, or studying and practicing a very strong energetic state, the vibrational state. Regarding the accommodation at Siayaki, there is the village hotel with comfortable rooms, a restaurant and cafeteria. Next to Siayaki, there is the Mabu Interludium Hotel with more higher-end facilities. The Siayaki Research Centre is located in the city of Iguazu Falls, which contains the immense Iguazu Waterfalls, one of the seven wonders of nature, and which will provide you with an unforgettable experience. And if you happen to be coming to Iguazu Falls, come visit us. You are very welcome here.
Preface to the Second Edition in English. This book was written in 1979 and first published in Portuguese in 1981. It is now in its fourth edition in Brazil. The facts narrated here continue to be experienced by billions of persons every night as they have since antiquity. The difference now is that the communication of these experiences is increasing with every year that passes without the folkloric and mystical connotations that have been attached to them for thousands of years. Conscientiology is the science that studies the consciousness in a comprehensive manner, with a multidimensional perspective. Projectiology is the formal study of the projection of the consciousness, or OBE. The International Bibliography of Projectiology contained 1,907 items in 1986. Today, in 1997, the International Bibliography of Conscientiology includes more than 5,100 entries. When I wrote this book in 1979, I proposed, at the end of Chapter 9, the Neologism Projectiology to name the new science that would study projection. Since 1986, there has been a sharp worldwide increase in many sectors of scientific research on the 54 basic phenomena of projectiology. Most notably, the near death experience or NDE. This research has served to confirm a great deal of our own findings. As promised in the introduction of this book, we published Projectiology An Overview of Experiences Outside the Human Body in 1986. That book is currently in its fifth edition in Brazil. It is a more extensive work in this area that serves to consolidate the practical research of conscientiology. When faced with the challenge of presenting timeless ideas and experiences in a contemporary manner, it is inevitable that a new nomenclature or vocabulary is generated. Projection is no exception. As such, the reader will find that new terms have been created in order to communicate the numerous aspects of projection as objectively and descriptively as possible. It is suggested that the reader become familiar with the glossary so that, with time, The vocabulary will become easier to understand and use. We have avoided using spirit, entity, reincarnation, and other terms that we consider to be outworn or to have religious or mystical connotations. For example, the consciousness, when used in the context of projectiology and conscientiology, does not imply a state of awareness or lucidity, but, rather, refers to the actual soul, spirit, Ego or intelligent principle. A great number of facts and phenomena detailed in the following pages have been confirmed, amplified, and clarified by occurrences during the past decade. In the period since 1981, we founded the Center of Continuous Consciousness, now deactivated. In 1988, the International Institute of Projectiology and Conscientiology, or IIPC, was founded. IIPC continues to sponsor several conferences, forums, and symposiums and has confirmed the discovery of new cultural and scientific facts every year since its inception. Reflecting the IIPC's rapid growth, our databanks show the following statistics Headquarters in Rio de Janeiro and almost 60 offices throughout Brazil, international offices in Barcelona, Buenos Aires, Caracas, London, Miami, New York, Ottawa, and Lisbon, over 500 active collaborators, a mailing list totaling over 50,000 individuals and institutions. Activities have been conducted in 82 cities in Brazil and other countries, 28 universities and research institutions, and 26 public and private companies, including the periodic offering of 24 regular and extracurricular courses. IIPC has held over 20 events, including the first International Congress of Projectiology in 1990, followed by the publication of the Annals of the Congress. In 1992, we published the Mini Glossary of Conscientiology. These efforts serve to open the way for the practical work, 700 Conscientiology Experiments, published in 1994 in Portuguese. According to our records, upwards of 45 institutions, besides IIPC, 
are currently dedicated to some type of dissemination about the phenomena of projectiology. Nevertheless, there is still much to be done to achieve universal acceptance of lucid projection and its practical applications in human life within the framework of conventional science, thus working towards a new society having transcendent ethics. We are counting on the help of new collaborators and researchers in other areas of science to further the sciences of conscientiology and projectiology. For all the reasons presented here, dear reader, we continue to count on your goodwill, good intentions, and discernment to deepen and amplify our understanding of ourselves through the conscientious and practical use of the lucid projection of the consciousness. Let us go forth and work together as we are now much greater in number, more united and cohesive, focusing on the liberating concepts of conscientiology, leading towards the maturity of the consciousness. Waldo Vieira, 1997. Introduction. In deciding on the direction of this book, I was faced with three options. First, to write only about that which conforms to accepted norms of current science, thus staying within the confines of my medical training, and suppressing certain information regarding extra-physical reality, as many authors have done in works which are currently in circulation. Second, to restrict and adapt myself to generally acceptable religious conditioning and profile my life as a psychic without expressing anything new. Third, to allow myself to commit to paper whatever I have experienced and witnessed in complete frankness without repressing, censoring or offending, while remaining true to my nature and to the ambience of the better areas of the extra-physical dimensions. Not having anything to hide, I opted for the later. This with the consent of the helpers, see Glossary, who presented me with an irresistible suggestion. I was to obtain information and write down everything I thought, felt, saw and remembered about the instructive excursions outside the Soma. For this, I would receive assistance in keeping records in order to convey the findings. I was to place primary emphasis on thinking in a disciplined way. I was to keep accurate records of the events in the first person and allow for their verification via independent studies undertaken by those open to intellectual exploration of the topic. In order to be impartial, authentic, and true to the facts, I sought to communicate the experience of the projections from a point of view in which the projector is a human laboratory, investigating its own universe, empirically but autobiographically. To accomplish this, I needed to lay bare my entire being. I used with all sincerity, unpretentious and dispassionate language presenting myself more as a spectator than as a protagonist, taking on the task of authenticating the extra-physical realities witnessed, stripped of any dogmatic spirit or scientific prejudice. Experiences outside the dense body are facts, regardless of how each person explains them to him or herself. To contribute to the development of new travellers outside of the dense body, I needed to function as a reporter, fulfilling the task assigned to him. I would seek to be worthy of the trust granted to a subordinate called upon to cooperate with the purposes of service and study. My conscience tells me that a more intense apprenticeship does not transform the imperfect, militant servant into an extra-physical traveller with an open passport to better dimensions. Just because the student chooses an exalted topic to research does not make him or her an exalted one. It only reveals his or her needs. Likewise, the fact that projection is inevitably a personal experience does not place one at a higher stage of evolution. There are myriads of schizophrenics who live semi-projected lives. Since I find myself with countless difficulties and personal shortcomings, 
it seemed recommendable that I do my best to settle old commitments with dignity, fulfilling my duties within the cosmoethic, extra-physical universal principles. Hence, this volume. Projection allows one to replace belief with knowledge. To believe in the accounts is secondary. What is important is to accept the possibility of extra-physical events. Ideally, the interested person will have his or her own experiences through training with four bodies, the soma, physical body, holochakra, psychosoma, extra-physical body, emotional body, astral body, and the mental soma, intellectual body. For this, it is necessary to discipline the memory and, above all, to sharpen one's mental concentration with a lot of willful determination, self-analysis, and perseverance by following techniques similar to those used here. After that, prepare yourself for deep renovation in all sectors of existence. Separations from the body are experienced every day by men and women during natural sleep. Having lucid memories of extra-physical occurrences remains the most difficult but surmountable problem. It is hampered by the biological impediments to recall. With practice, the extra-physical exchange allowed by conscious projection will become increasingly frequent. There will be a day when the level of awareness on Earth will reach beyond the current impossible longing to take all friends and acquaintances one by one to see something of the vibrating life outside of the human body. In reality, it becomes impractical, even with the use of all available dictionaries, to narrate precisely what can be perceived, thought, felt and done in somewhat evolved extra-physical environments. Projection breaks down the intraphysical barricades of the human condition. The reader should not be surprised to find chapters containing themes rarely approached, such as self-induced projection, guided projection, cleansing projection, energetic bridge, extra-physical bait, extra-physical communicability, consensual leisure, cosmoethic, Silver cord, energetic cord, free consciousness, invisible unions, mental targets, mental soma, psychic signals, pregnant projector, super consciousness, hour of human anguish, vibrational state, and crash projector. New and original subjects will also be encountered such as Self-embrace, self-telekinesis, consensuology, empty brain, extra-physical shocks, extra-physical Trendelenburg, hydromagnetic shower, in-block recollection, inverse landing, psychophonic monologue, projectiology, quintessential chord, partial projection, Simulated existential series, transmental dialogue, vibratory, valve, and others. According to Consentiology, the cosmoethic is always evolving, as is everything. Practical and descriptive, more objective than literary, this book is composed of technical accounts of more than 60 conscious disengagements from the soma selected from those which occurred during non-consecutive nights in the second half of 1979. Emphasis was given to those projections which offered greater evidence or clarification of multidimensionality. They ranged from the simple to the complex, from the brief to the more prolonged, from the nearby to those far away, from those of a cleansing nature to those of profound destiny, from those in which the psychosoma was used to others in which only the mental soma was utilised, aiming to reveal the anatomy of projection in all of its aspects and trace the panoramic lines of exchange among the spheres of existence. During this period, there were dozens of other projections not mentioned due to insufficient data resulting from memory failures. 
I omitted some assisted excursions because of their similarity or repetition of topics. I deleted other projective experiences at the suggestion of the helpers for several secondary reasons. Each account is divided into the following parts. The period prior to the projection of the psychosoma or the beginning of the technical record. The extra physical period constituting the narration of the occurrences outside of the physical body. After returning, the period immediately after awakening, which I call the technical register and observations made regarding the projection. The descriptions, technical records and analytic index of topics permit the interested reader to research the methods employed, to analyse and classify and arrive at his or her own conclusions about the facts. This data may be employed for a comparative study of projections with their personal experiences or with those of a third party. In order to allow detailed examination of the projections, a certain amount of repetition in the technical records was inevitable. Eventually, I intend to offer the public another book in which I will bring together detailed techniques and studies derived from observations made during hundreds of projections I experienced during my three most recent intensive experimental projective phases. Everything began with intermittent projections that started in 1941, at the age of nine, in a spontaneous whirlwind projection. I wish to express my gratitude to the helpers who co-authored this volume, particularly to Transmental, André Luiz, Euripides Bassanufu, José Grosso, Aura Celeste, Aristina, Alex, Tao Mao, Maria Clara, and so many others who do not wish to identify themselves. Over the course of time, they have taken me along on many assistential excursions. Although a veteran in practice, I still consider myself to be an apprentice of projection. As such, I am likely to commit errors with respect to details which will have to be corrected later. Also, there are questions scattered throughout the text, illustrating that the extra-physical world, the consciousness and its manifestations are themes of research open to questioning and interpretation, even by the most studious extra-physical consciousness. Chapter 32 If I may express a small wish, it is that I am able to peruse these candid notes during my next intraphysical, physical life. In the hope that this sincere message proves to be useful for those who research the projection of the psychosoma and mental soma, their relationships and consequences, I present this work, having exercised great care to ensure its accuracy. And with the best of intentions, I dedicate this message to youths who are now becoming adults. To all those who decide to traverse the ways of projection, go my most ardent hopes of success. Above all, I offer my most fervent and constant wish that humanity achieves in the shortest time the largest possible number of extra-physical consciousnesses and persons with continuous consciousness. Transfigurations Prior to projection, Friday, July 13th, 1979, I was in the bedroom, an isolated part of my apartment on Visconde de Piraja Street in Ipanema, Rio de Janeiro. I regard it as the landing strip when I travel out of the body. I use a darkening curtain in the room, which immerses the surroundings in semi-darkness, allowing me to maintain visual points of reference and get in and out of bed without losing my bearings. After feeling prolonged pressure in the area of the solar plexus, I began preparations for a projection, out-of-body experience, under the guidance of the helpers, spirit guides. I went to bed for the second time this night at 10.16pm, according to the digital clock placed at the head of the bed. This and almost all of the projections narrated here 
are nocturnal due to my work schedule. I attend to intraphysical existence during the day and dedicate nightlife to the extraphysical dimension, non-physical dimension, as a projector. The position of the soma, physical body, on the bed was dorsal, as it will be for almost all of the experiences described here, with the head pointing towards geographical east. Little by little, I cease to feel the soma. The vibrational state, sensation of tingling and pulsations throughout the soma arrived, followed by a short period of discomfort. Removing all other ideas, I continued concentrating on saturating the mind with a single thought, a strong desire to leave and float over the soma lying on the bed. The takeoff of the psychosoma, astral body, occurred. Extraphysical period. My intense desire to project from the soma had met with success. I was vividly aware of being in a semi-lit place, but it was night time. I was experiencing the sensation of being a crash projector in a large open-air amphitheater with many people scattered about. Upon leaving and floating well above the opening of the amphitheater, my presence in rapid flight caught the attention of some extra-physical consciousnesses, spirits. A female extra-physical consciousness, having unmistakable sensual intentions, made a mental proposition revealing her nude extra-physical body. I cordially withdrew, but something indefinable forced me to return to the soma. I came back to the proximity of the soma without completely re-entering it and experienced vibratory sensations again, a brief period of discomfort and a new takeoff. I had the definite feeling of going out through the window, as the rays of the sun were shining in through the window panes in the direction of Barao da Torre Street and rising towards Corcovado Mountain. The extraphysical consciousness A appeared. After a while, I saw what looked like a lamppost and the sidewalk in front of a house. The night was clear. A was transfigured into a dark-complexioned youth, different from the blonde first grader I had known him as. From deep within me came the intuition of the appearance of another extraphysical consciousness, a pleasant old man deformed by an enormous semi-open tumour on his left side between the neck and shoulder. He mentally transmitted, Do you want to see how strong I am? He lunged forward, at which point I held him up with a sort of embrace. Smiling and joking, he twisted his whole extra-physical body around. Then, two more extra-physical consciousnesses appeared, gliding down the street. As they approached, the lines on their faces grew clear. They were females of advanced age, two look-alike sisters. Through the intuition that one naturally experiences while outside the body, I knew that all three, the two sisters and the old man, were deceased Germans known by A. The locale must have been the extra-physical region over Europe. For a moment, in a sudden transfiguration, the two sisters assumed a youthful appearance. The face of one of them was covered with lesions or smallpox scars. Both were dressed in red, wearing small shawls and walked arm in arm. I asked myself, did they produce the transfigurations themselves or was a helper producing the images? Then, yet another extra-physical consciousness appeared, but it was not possible to identify it as the call came for the long trip back to the soma and resulted in an imposed re-entry into it. After returning, upon awakening, my hands were icy, but neither my hands nor my soma felt cold. The absence of the psychosoma from the soma had lasted more than an hour. A strong extra-physical force came over me. I became passive, and the extra-physical consciousness, Jose Grosso, transmitted audible instructions through my vocal apparatus to my wife, Elizabeth, my intraphysical assistant during my projections, about the intensification of the upcoming work, envisioning the elaboration of this book. Observations The extra-physical multidimensional team, composed of constantly serene, dignified and benevolent helpers, assist those while projected to perform works using ectoplasm. 
This is similar to that which was performed during meetings in which I had participated over a long period of time at the Casa de Cinza in Uberaba, a city in the state of Minas Gerais, Brazil, more than two decades before. The vibrational state is characterized by the movement of internal pulsating waves similar to electrical vibrations whose occurrence, frequency and intensity can be controlled at will to be fast or slow, strong or weak. These waves sweep the immobilized soma from head to hands and feet, returning to the brain in a steady cycle of a few seconds. The occurrence at times seems like a burning torch, surging and ebbing, or a ball of tolerable electricity guided at will. Not uncommonly, the vibrations produce a sensation of inflation, common in psychophony, vocal channeling, with the apparent expansion and swelling of the hands, feet, lips, cheeks, chin, and solar plexus area. The complete installation of the vibrational state is what permits a lucid takeoff and, by itself, constitutes incontestable personal evidence of the existence of the psychosoma. Chapter 2 Morphothocenes Prior to Projection Wednesday, July 18th, 1979. I went to bed physically tired at 10.35 p.m. Extra physical period. I awoke outside the soma, next to a few extra physical consciousnesses whom I had met when they had undergone a treatment program a while back. Among the five extra physical consciousnesses, one stood out, a tall man with straight hair and an aristocratic nose wearing a large shawl as if it were a cape. It was clear that he was a sick male consciousness in convalescence, but endowed with an intense mental power to sculpt morphothocenes, thought forms, which he composed and animated at will. I recognised the extraphysical consciousness to be Carnot, an eccentric friend from my childhood in Monte Carmelo, my birthplace in the state of Minas Gerais, Brazil. He was there recuperating from a prolonged psychopathology by exercising the beneficial use of morphothocenes, providing entertainment for extraphysical consciousnesses needing distraction in order to help them recover. This was leisure activity functioning in favour of evolution of the consciousness. It was said that Carnot was a person who had gone insane due to excessive study. His eccentricities and appearance had changed a great deal. He performed a few demonstrations using the power of thought and appeared fully capable of performing the wonders of Mandrake the Magician. Since energy can be influenced by thought, it can be used to produce instantaneous wonders for one who is capable of controlling it. Carnot manufactured extravagant extra-physical clothes, alternately dressing himself and those present with his creations. He formed incredibly tiny objects with lightning speed. Standing before the crowd, he devised incredibly horrible as well as beautiful masks for all present, beginning with himself. In spite of his persistent prodding, the other extra-physical consciousnesses were not able to create any objects or shapes. The process appeared to demand a lot of consensual energy, energy modified by the consciousness concentration, quick and creative thought, practice, attention to detail and an adequate environment for the energies of the one commanding the process. What would the technique be to mentally create a duplicate of the psychosoma, I wondered. In that dimension, Carnot dominates everything. He is the ruling fish in those waters an absolute wizard who abruptly turns the most unusual whims of the imagination into reality. Those present did not hide their fear of his power. It was necessary to treat him like an old friend, with understanding, not fear, just like someone who visits a hospital for the mentally ill and partakes in the jokes and childish behaviour of even the most mischievous resident. 
with a thousand positive thoughts, I wished that Carnot would soon recuperate in order to use his fabulous mental energy in the field of human creativity. At that point, I felt the characteristic discomfort beckoning the return to the soma. After returning, my lucid separation from the soma had lasted more than an hour. I received no suggestion to record any of the events and the period of wakefulness seemed brief, like a simple interlude before another anticipated projection. Observations. Following are some aspects and factors that should be observed when preparing to have a projection. 1. Bed. The projector's bed should be as comfortable, stable and quiet as possible. If one does not sleep alone, it is best to use a bed that reduces interference from the movements of one's partner, squeaky springs, etc. 2. Clock. The use of a digital clock is useful for noting the time your projection began and ended and the amount of time spent outside the physical body. 3. Confidence. A positive, confident and determined attitude. 4. Doors. Make sure you will not be disturbed during the projective exercise. 5. Extra physical patience. Extra physical consciousnesses may be waiting in the projectarium for energy treatments from the advanced projector. 6. Family members. Try to avoid interruptions of the projective exercise by family members. 7. Flashlight. The use of a flashlight can help the projector to write down the major points of a projection after returning to the body without disturbing their sleeping partner. 8. Intraphysical assistance. It is useful to have someone monitor the well-being of the physical body during the projective exercise. 9. Lights. Dim light. A nightlight, for example, can be helpful in orienting the projector when he or she is projected in the bedroom, as well as upon getting up after the projection. This also reduces physical stimulus, which is counterproductive to the projective process. 10. Bedside table. A bedside table is useful for keeping such objects as paper, pencil, pen or tape recorder at hand in order to allow the projector to record extra physical events immediately upon returning to the soma. 11. Personal hygiene. Take care of physical needs before attempting to project. 12. Nourishment. Prior to the projective exercise, the projector should avoid heavy meals as well as the consumption of excessive amounts of liquids, especially those that are stimulants. 13. Nearby noises. Minimise noise. The projector may wish to turn off the telephone, intercom system, alarms, radios and TVs. Percussive noises are especially to be avoided. 14. Self-energisation. Working with energy exercises, especially the circulation and exteriorization of energy, serves to loosen the hollow chakra's energetic adhesion of the soma to the psychosoma. 15. Surroundings. Familiar, comfortable surroundings facilitate projection. 16. Thocenes. An individual's thocenes affect the profile and quality of the projection. 17. Visual reference points. It is helpful to have visual points of reference during the projection. Chapter 3 a unique educational institution. Prior to projection. Thursday, July 19th, 1979. One o'clock in the morning. Second sleep of the night. Continuation of the previous projection related in chapter two. Extra physical period. I became lucid upon entering into some sort of construction with a high roof and arched doors. It was an enormous educational institution. Upon going through one of the large doors, a shining extra physical consciousness approached me and, while staring at me, emitted this thought. So, do you recognize me? 
I looked at the young face of apparently 13 years with big eyes and black skin, radiating contagious happiness. I instantly recognized him. It was Tancredo, a very sick boy whom I had treated until his inevitable biological, intraphysical, death a long time ago at my clinic in the city of Uberaba, Brazil. He was one of many whom I had seen and no longer remembered. The impact of the surprise brought me uncontrollable emotion. Nothing was said. Communication occurred through pure thought transmission. The profound satisfaction of seeing Tancredo again moved me to embrace him as I addressed the thought to him. Look, I'm conscious. After returning to the Soma, I can remember these occurrences. Isn't it marvellous? The flow of his thoughts returned firmly. Yes, it's marvellous. But take advantage of it in order to take ideas back to your physical world. Don't miss the opportunity. Mentally, I quickly asked, Take what? Do you have any lessons to offer me? Yes. Analyse how electronic equipment functions. It radiates waves that not only interfere with the minds of children, but also with the process of projection by affecting the vibrations in the structure of the psychosoma. Think about the effects of this radiation and their consequences. He had not pronounced anything with his mouth, nor had I heard words with my ears. Sometimes, in the extraphysical dimension, the words one hears or the thoughts one captures appears as if they were echoes. It seems that we know the extraphysical consciousness's thoughts before they are expressed. As a general rule, the projector hears the thought of the extraphysical consciousness in the extraphysical dimension like he hears the voice of a person while in the waking state. He revealed that the institution that sheltered him belongs to the Ascensal extraphysical colony situated on the outskirts of the city of Patrocinio in the state of Minas Gerais, Brazil. There were extraphysical consciousnesses in conditions similar to Tancredo's who preferred to reduce their apparent age and behave like adolescents in order to better prepare for their upcoming intraphysical life. The candidate for physical rebirth transformed not only his or her appearance, but also the attitudes, interests, occupation and lifestyle and created a likeness of the conditions he or she would soon confront. The educational institution had hundreds of extraphysical residents and welcomes visits from projected persons, utilizing their dense energies in order to give the environment even greater authenticity. With the assistance of other extraphysical consciousnesses, Tancredo had created an environment for himself having an ambience of installations similar to that in which he will live during his next intraphysical life. Placing himself in a sort of mini-existence, a pre-existence, or a simulated existence, he models, using morphothocines, the same conditions that he will face in terrestrial life. It is an extra-physical setting similar to the workplace of his future profession as a research engineer in electronics. This specialised resource of creating a simulated intra-physical reality benefits the candidates for rebirth who have personal merit and are preparing to work at specific tasks in a certain community or multidimensional team. This shows that they are doing and will do what they enjoy, having gained experience in previous intraphysical lives. They thus try, as opportunity permits, to lay a foundation in order to enrich the memory bank of the next biological body. The process of setting up a scenario of the future as a preview of the next life of the person, brought to mind the simulated voyage training of astronauts, where each one practices wearing a specialised suit for the performance of space missions. The higher the intraphysical evolutionary level one enjoys, the better the extraphysical conditions will have been prior to one's rebirth. On some advanced planets, the difference between the intraphysical and extraphysical dimensions can hardly be felt. This is not the case on Earth, where we still confront extremely diverse conditions, not only in terms of the organism, but in the environment in which it must survive. After a festive farewell, Tancredo left, emotionally touched by my lucid presence. As I reflected on the event, another little boy arrived carrying some kind of apparatus in his hand. 
He stopped in the middle of the passageway, looking like a watchman, and addressed me with a sharp thought. Hold it there. Don't try to pass, or I will use this instrument. It can deform your face. I sent him thoughts telling him to calm down, explaining that I was a peaceful visitor and was already leaving. I asked myself, has he noticed that I am a projected person? Only then was it possible for me to observe the institution's surroundings. The place was an immense workshop, crammed with scrap iron, thousands of parts, sections of machines, workbenches and hanging objects, all of which were more consistent morphothocines. Adolescent-looking extraphysical consciousnesses were practicing the mental sculpting of morphothocines and working with the tools and other objects they had created learning to materialise things in preparation for their coming intraphysical life. I did not write down the duration of this projection, which must have lasted more than an hour. The emotional impact of seeing Tancredo again triggered my precipitated return to the soma. Emotionalism generally reduces our rationality, robbing us of the ability to make serene, intelligent decisions. After returning, an extraphysical consciousness having the appearance of a young girl informed my wife by speaking through me that, in work in which only two persons are apparent, there are many consciousnesses, including some projected individuals actively participating in the work, depending on the night. This young girl also works at the educational institution that prepares extraphysical consciousnesses for their next intraphysical life. Later, my extraphysical friend, Jose Grosso appeared, performed some energy exercises and departed, leaving an intense flow of energy in his wake. I immediately began to record this as well as the previous entry while fully alert in the office of my apartment. What a difference! I went to sleep so tired, roamed around and was now feeling fine. Observations Projections show us that one should never undervalue personal acquaintances and friendships made during human existence, no matter how insignificant they may seem. As no intelligence becomes extinct in the course of evolution, sooner or later, here in matter, or elsewhere in the extraphysical dimension, destinies will cross renewing relationships. Chapter 4 the open window. Prior to projection, Friday, July 20th, 1979. I went to bed at 10.01 p.m. It had been an atypical day with a trip to Sao Paulo where I had spent five hours waiting between shuttle flights. I was tired. In preparation for projection, I emitted energy, especially from the solar plexus area. Extraphysical period. I do not recall any details of the psychosoma taking off. I acquired lucidity in an unknown room with a half-open window. There was a man sleeping alone near the window. It was raining outside. The wind caused the window to move back and forth, almost noiselessly. Some raindrops managed to land in the dark bedroom, where only a faint light entered the half-open window. In a futile effort, I tried to close the window. Even though I could feel the two bottom corners of each half of the opened window, I was not able to move, much less close the window. This frustrated attempt at moving physical objects while projected, in spite of the effort and willpower I used, brought me the exact notion of what an extraphysical consciousness experiences and feels when not able to contact intraphysical loved ones due to the differences in density between dimensions. I did not feel the presence of the helpers during takeoff. I wasn't able to gather any details about the sleeping person or his residence. I fixed most of my attention on the window in that rustic environment. Everything indicated that the helpers were assisting the possibly sick man. After that, I felt the return to the soma and the subsequent awakening. After returning, I looked at the clock. It was 10.36pm. 
It had rained during the day. The rain had stopped, but it was cold. I had the clear impression that I would not be able to remember the whole extraphysical visit in the morning. For this reason, I did not immediately record the extraphysical events, but left them for the morning. I later documented the projection using a small tape recorder. Observations With the window closing attempt, I confirmed once more the difficulty of overcoming the natural impossibilities of direct contact between extraphysical and intraphysical consciousnesses and influencing objects and people while projected. There are other simple physical actions, always problematic, which are nonetheless experiences to be attempted during projections for the personal development of the projector trying to improve their energy transmission skills. What is the method that works best when attempting to affect the physical environment using the psychosoma? Can we pinch a friend, tickle the ear or touch someone's face, ring a doorbell, unlock a door, put out a candle, turn on a light using a light switch, switch on the TV or the radio, open a closed book, flip a page of an open book, knock on a door or tap on a tabletop, lift and carry a small object, turn on a water faucet, pull open the refrigerator door, pick up a piece of food. Which manifestation requires the least amount of energy? Turning on a flashlight with a pressure switch? The telekinetic phenomenon is the capacity to affect physical matter by causing static objects to move and even float in mid-air. This can also be performed by a projector and thus shows the existence of a percentage of matter in the psychosoma. If the psychosoma were an abstract structure, empty and completely immaterial, it would not be able to act upon dense matter. The projector should attempt these actions when he feels the psychosoma to be in a denser state. This will facilitate contact with the object and the production of physical effects. Repercussions or shocks to the soma during some re-entries of the psychosoma constitutes further evidence of the existence of matter in the structure of the psychosoma. Chapter 5 Ideal Assistance Prior to Projection Tuesday, July 24th, 1979 I went to bed at 8.05 p.m. Shortly after, the extraphysical consciousness, Jose Grosso, began working with energy while coupled with me. I stayed semi-conscious until 9 p.m. I was alone in the bedroom with the door closed. The helper, Jose Grosso, radiated energy through me having me sit on the bed several times. Then the team of extraphysical consciousnesses attended to someone in front and to the right of my soma. The psychosoma is a condenser of cosmic energies, psionics in parapsychology. Emission of denser energy is used to assist psychotic postmortems, earthbound spirits, see glossary, as well as to reduce the density of the psychosoma while projected. With time, one becomes accustomed to living with both the dense soma and the subtle psychosoma. During the semi-consciousness of the projective trance, I clearly felt an influx of energy concentrated on the right cerebral hemisphere. It involved pressure over the forehead and, after a while, it remained on the right side of my forehead only. I fell asleep after 11.15pm. Extra Physical Period I became lucid outside of the soma on an unfamiliar street in a neighborhood with regular and steep streets in the north zone of Rio de Janeiro. Something told me that it was shortly after midnight. I had a clear sensation of having been peacefully left on the street. I walked down one of the commercial avenues for quite a while, strolling among people and examining the street scenes particularly in places with lights and small gatherings of people, like bars and nightclub entrances. I did not experience any attempt at interaction by the extraphysical pedestrians. While passing a bar, I observed a conversation going on inside. Someone entered and bought some mint candy, which the cashier took out of a glass jar. 
I counted three intraphysical consciousnesses and two extraphysical consciousnesses inside the bar. At the end of the main street, in a small square with a few trees and benches, I came across an extraphysical consciousness who looked like a doctor. His name came to mind, Kalmeen, strong, athletic looking, blondish and appearing to be about 45 years old. He was attending to some extraphysical consciousnesses needing assistance. That stretch of street seemed better lit than the others. Upon exchanging mental messages with him, he quickly explained to me that his routine work was helping the needy. At night, the specialised task becomes intense as extraphysical consciousnesses, especially sick ones, enter into contact with sleeping persons. Each assistant in that work takes care of a defined area of service. The traffic, except in the main street, was light. Hardly any cars passed at all. There were many cars parked in the square. The doctor revealed plans to expand the assistance with the use of projected companions, creating a larger assistential team. This special brigade would be used for mainly nighttime assistance services in a specific place in one of the poorly lit and deserted cross streets where their services would be centralised. The task did not appear to be very simple. From 6pm on, when the greatest human anguish starts, the assistential team tries to diminish the depression, despair, sadness, longings, doubts, resentments, loneliness and problems stemming from the unstructured relationships typical of big cities. He told me that the least pleasant aspect was that some intraphysical as well as extraphysical consciousnesses refuse to be assisted. Sometimes they don't even want to be approached, rejecting the extraphysical assistance. The assistance work, far more complex than it seemed, functioned by linking itself to a nucleus of police stations, emergency care units, hospitals, several temples, the Salvation Army, suicide prevention centres, Alcoholics Anonymous and other physical crisis control groups. I deduced that such services by helpers existed not only throughout the city but in other places as well, especially in larger metropolises. Before saying goodbye, Carmine appeared to concentrate and offered me a small message as an exercise in mental concentration regarding ideal assistance. Every act of social assistance, no matter how small, signifies fraternity, is productive and deserves praise. Any kind of human assistance is better than none. Nevertheless, the ideal social assistance has its own unmistakable universalistic characteristics. It is not official since it is spontaneous. It is not a tax-deductible donation. It does not have a professional title. It has no secondary or political intentions. It does not back a personal image or cultivate myths. It does not encourage segregation of any kind. It is not restricted by prejudice. It does not expect gratitude nor require public understanding. It does not disseminate the act of assistance, regardless of circumstances. It is the donation of oneself, simple, pure and direct, without mediation, demands or conditions, and everyone can practice it in silence. On Earth, a planet with many countries, creatures, customs, religions and interests, all inhabitants are naturally brothers. Happy are those who learn the universalistic principle, maximise fraternity, overcome taboos and perform universalistic assistance while still in human life. In this way, they first receive the benefit of terrestrial liberation on the way to higher levels. Could it be more logical? The message was clear, categorical and unambiguous. I expressed my thanks and said goodbye to the attentive doctor, who left towards one of the cross streets. 
I walked through the lights and shadows of the main street, passing idle transients and lazy extraphysical consciousnesses, and then returned immediately to the soma. After returning, upon awakening at 1.43 a.m., the soma was in the same position as before, the dorsal position, motionless, with arms extended and hands spread out on the legs. Chapter 6 At the Atoll Does Rockers Prior to Projection Wednesday, July 25th, 1979 After recording the events of the trip outside the Soma in Rio de Janeiro's North Zone, I went back to bed at 3.33am, lying in the prone position, with the left side of my face on the pillow. Extra-physical period. I gained awareness on an islet where a group of helpers were taking care of an extra-physical consciousness. He was sitting down and looked like a soldier with the intense stare characteristic of a psychotic post-mortem. He wore a light-coloured, torn shirt and stared out over the ocean to the distant horizon. The images in the demented soldier's psychosphere aura revealed that the right pants leg and heavy boot of his companion were hanging from the rocks. The pants were made of a thick grey cloth. On the small island I tested my sensory inputs. I felt the cold water under the feet of my psychosoma. I heard waves breaking on the rocks and saw the tide running over the light coloured sand. The sea was bluish. The waves crashed over a small portion of the sand and rocks in a narrow spot to the left of the extra-physical consciousness who was being assisted. One of the helpers mentally explained that the place was called the Atoll Does Rockers. They were assisting a sick extra-physical consciousness, a prisoner of implacably fixed ideas who had been isolated on the island for a long time still believing that he was among humans. He had died during a dramatic event with a co-worker. This accounted for the vivid mental images I observed on the low rock. The ailing extra-physical consciousness was picked up by the group of helpers and taken away. When I returned to the intraphysical base, my bedroom, I noticed that the soma was still in the prone position. As I lay on top of the soma, entering it through the back, I clearly heard a soft, peaceful voice that sounded like someone speaking through a thin tube. It was the voice of a female extra-physical consciousness. The psychosoma was still not aligned with the soma. Voldo, Voldo, wake up. The gentle call was repeated twice, whereupon I fully re-entered the soma. After returning, in order to confirm whether or not the voice had been that of an extra-physical consciousness, I asked my wife, Lisa, did you call me? She informed me that she had not called me, and at that instant, all the memories of the events at the Atoll Does Rockers came rushing into my head. I checked the clock, 4.36am. I could never forget the helper's call echoing in my head like a timely alarm that did not scare me and without which I probably would not have immediately awakened or recalled the extra-physical events in this record. Observations To what extent did the prone position affect the difficulty of the awakening of the soma? Chapter 7 Extra-Physical Pantomimes Prior to Projection Wednesday, July 25th, 1979 I went to sleep for the second time tonight at 9.05pm. I was sleepy as I lay down on the left side. Extra-physical period I became lucid in the extra-physical dimension and, soon after, 
I unmistakably identified the extraphysical surroundings. I was in Paris. After performing some extraphysical assistance, the group of helpers permitted me to leave in order to make some observations for the purpose of these records. I began the descent down a slightly inclined, tree-lined boulevard next to some parked cars. As I glided down the sidewalk, I was thinking about having come to Paris in circumstances quite different from past trips. It was a journey far removed from what I was accustomed to because I was travelling without the SOMA. I had not paid the compulsory travel tax in effect in Brazil, did not have to pay airfare, was not carrying a passport, did not have a fixed address in the city and was not carrying any money. My thoughts attracted and inspired some extraphysical consciousnesses who were practicing the creation of morphothocines and somehow could capture my thoughts there on the street. Were they extraphysical actors? The group of about eight extraphysical consciousnesses, some of them playful and apparently harmless, were playing with forms they created instantaneously. At that point, I realised that they were stopping anyone who was passing on the street to serve as protagonist in their pantomimes in that improvised arena. One of them grabbed me as if by the collar. Funny, I was dressed in shirt and coat, perhaps due to habits from prior trips, and emitted his thoughts with mannerisms typical of a French artist, emphatically proclaiming to the other observers, Look! This one here does not have documents. He doesn't exist. He came from very far away. He is clandestine. There is nothing I can do but call the inspector. At the same instant, another one appeared in front of me and two others behind me. They were transformed into policemen, holding and pointing huge, extravagant machine guns, each one giving strict orders. They formed a circle around me and looked menacing. I knew I had nothing to fear and that it would be better to play along, participating in the farce, while these strangers exhibited their capacity to create morphothocines as a kind of extra-physical pastime. I was trying to keep in mind the facts that pertain to me as a character. A fifth extra-physical consciousness dressed himself as a higher-ranked policeman, came towards the others and stated, Hold it there. I am the inspector. I am in possession of this citizen's documents and have come on his behalf. Free him. From inside his huge coat, he started pulling out, one by one, an extensive collection of documents of all types, shapes and forms, constituting an enormous pile. As he continued to take documents out of his coat, more would appear from the seemingly bottomless pocket. The spectators were delighted by the scene, although some wore expressions of fear and astonishment, not understanding the significance of the events and perhaps hoping not to become victims of jokes that could be played on them as well. These adults acted like adolescent students, playing practical jokes on each other. To what extent could these extra-physical consciousnesses be classified as pranksters? Moments later, another extra-physical pedestrian caught their attention and became the centre of their momentary interest. I went down the street and, after a few moments, felt the call to return to the Soma. I still had fragmentary recollections of isolated extra-physical episodes prior to this event. Images of ageing marks on the walls of buildings, assistance given to a projected woman and her small projected daughter who had a deep gash on the right side of her forehead and the entrance to an old building under renovation. After returning, in less than a minute after awakening, recollections of the main occurrences of the projection came to me in their entirety. Soon thereafter, Fragmented memories of isolated episodes of other brief events that had preceded the last occurrence also returned. I checked the clock, 10.46pm. 
Paris is even further away than the atoll does rockers. The tension and distension of the silver cord present important aspects for study. Observations Outside the soma, it is imperative to constantly police one's thoughts because they come to life, act, create and behave as we find ourselves in an exclusively thought-based existence in which it seems possible to produce everything that the will desires. Another reason to police our thoughts is that in the extra-physical dimension they can be perceived by others in the vicinity or even at a distance. Chapter 8 Unexpected Encounter Prior to Projection Friday, July 28th, 1979 I went to bed for the last time this night at 4.21am. Before this, one of the helpers performed energy exercises while coupled with me. This had begun soon after awakening from the prior sleep and lasted for more than half an hour. I heard a rooster crow, which is a common occurrence here in Ipanema. The ambient temperature was 68 degrees Fahrenheit. I lay on the right side. Extra physical period. I found myself outside the soma going along a road with small, primitive rural buildings, a lot of dust and an appearance of poverty. Dawn was breaking. The inhabitants along the road were waking up and the little rustic houses were beginning to come to life. One of the houses, its front door open, had smoke coming out of the chimney. A path of beaten earth was used for the vehicles to reach the farms. Looking at the ground, I managed to detect three slightly shining, used Brazilian coins that stood out from the dust on the side of the road. Suddenly I thought, I am outside the Soma in Brazil. I need to make sure of this. As I scanned the area to see if anyone was there, a smiling young man appeared. I got closer to see better and a bronzed, healthy face came into clearer view. Hey, it's Pinheiro. The extra physical consciousness only smiled as if in agreement, but did not emit any specific thought. He seemed to be in excellent extra physical condition. The recollections of Pinheiro came to me in perfect detail. He was one of the brothers in a family that lived in the district of Alto de Santo Benedito, in the city of Uberaba. Pinheiro was one of the younger brothers of a friend of mine in high school. I asked instantly, What? Have you already died? He responded clearly in a flash of thought. Yes, more than five years ago. I decided to say goodbye and terminate the mental dialogue. I thought, I want to remember this. I'm going to return to the Soma right now. Thought is living power. I simply emitted the idea and I was instantly awake, finalizing the extra physical experience with a long breath. After returning, I was still lying on the right side. The night remained dark as the clock showed 5.12 a.m. The memories of the projection came to me in their entirety in a pleasant manner. I felt that I had achieved a victory by passing a difficult test with my memory. Observations. Two facts about this projection should be clarified. I was surprised that I could detect the coins in the dust while outside the soma, as I have been short-sighted since adolescence. I was also impressed by how current inflation has undercut the worth of small, low-value coins. How did I arrive at the road? Was it on my own? Or was I moved by someone invisible to me? Could it have been Pinheiro? 
It is sometimes quite inconvenient for a projector to keep a record of events, as it interrupts the night's rest. However, there is no other solution, given the fleeting nature of the recollection of extraphysical events. A diary serves another important function. The registering of extraphysical events augments the projector's capacity for detailed observation and for the consequent translation of the experience into words. This is not an easy accomplishment. Chapter 9 Transmental Debates Prior to Projection July 29, 1979 I went to bed physically tired at 9.10pm after an atypical Sunday of intense family activity with relatives from out of town. Second sleep at 12.15am on Monday lying on the left side. Extraphysical period. I was lucid upon entering an extraphysical institution among various candidates for rebirth who were going to be given the specific task of disseminating the principles and laws of cosmoethics, elevated extraphysical principles. There was a presentation of topics and debates with a small group of about 15 extraphysical consciousnesses whose most recent intraphysical lives apparently had taken place in different geographic areas and in various types of occupations. I was evidently an observer, listening incidentally, a sideline spectator or apprentice, not participating directly in the work, just collecting information for immediate entry into these projective records. Although the task of presenting these topics is immense and complex, I will try to present a few of the aspects gathered during my observations. I did not perceive the presence of any senior expositor. It appeared to be a meeting of a study group trying to come up with common viewpoints regarding the transmission of liberating ideas during the next intraphysical life. The main debate revolved around the traditional nature of the dissemination of spiritual ideas among people and the consequent development of prejudice, fanaticism and sectarianism. There were two distinct teams. In each one, the leader and two other debaters stood out by their heated remarks. My arrival halfway into the debate made it impossible to capture the details of the topics as they had been developed from the beginning. I also did not have the opportunity to be present to hear the final conclusions of the study group, if there were any. It was obvious that one team had more rigorous and radical thoughts than the other, which was less extreme and had more liberal opinions. As our thoughts are easily perceived by others while outside the soma, my sympathy for the latter team was noticed by the helper next to me. References were made to current oriental sects, to the philosophical concepts of theosophy, to Umbanda studies, Brazilian spiritual practice originating in Africa, and other mediumistic or trans-oriented sects, including voodoo, to semi-secret organisations, to the current Kardecist bases, Brazilian spiritual practice founded by Allan Kardec, originating in France, to the ideological assistance work based on the Gospel of Christ, performed by various religions and beliefs, to the assertions of Buddha and Muhammad, to the work of Swedenborg, as well as brief analysis of democracy and Gandhi. Without being able to intervene, the exposure to the themes of discussion made me feel like my personal values were being held in judgment before me. This would happen with anyone there who had defined principles with respect to extra-physical life. There was a strong consensus regarding the excessively romantic dissemination of the gospel. 
Even though it was considered to be the best material available, it was not the ideal form for the dissemination of ideas on evolution of the consciousness. The repetition of ideas found in the Gospels becomes tiring and ineffective on those who are caught up in the current technological era. An approach that is not too technical on one hand and not too sugar-coated and watered down on the other is needed in order to motivate without imposing conditioning, prejudice and deplorable extremism that have led to many recent social calamities. The abuse of disguised or semi-instinctive mysticism, the search for illicit and transitory enrichment, and the acquisition of temporary power came to mind. All these create violence, terror, needless sacrifices, abstruse rituals, and the passivity of the unwary who follow the negative messianism of the pathological leadership of false religions which are powered by personal interests. This instigates fanaticism, impedes public order, and sacrifices consensual evolution and social progress by involving insecure, unstable, and fragile humans in the clamour of group errors, as occurred in the massacre in British Guiana. Thinking about the conciliatory middle ground, I record the philosophical, moral, and scientific, although shallow, principles of Allan Kardec, founder of the above-mentioned Kardecist spiritual practice. I would like to point out that between orthodoxy and universalism, I opt for the latter. Universalism is centrist and moderate, while orthodoxy is extremist and radical, and as such becomes segregationist. It is foolish for one who has obtained a doctorate to regularly belittle those who are educated by the same school. At this point in the debate, it became time for my departure, as I felt the traction of the silver cord calling me back to dense matter. After returning, upon awakening, I checked the clock, 1.47am. The ideas of the debates I had witnessed began to gently come to mind. How good would it be if there were more physiological and extra-physical resources in the soma and psychosoma respectively, to enhance the recall of the transmental dialogues, ideas and perceptions filed deep within my memory. At times, it seems that a thick veil falls over my recollections. There is a great lack of fidelity in the intraphysical memory. Observations The achievement of a high degree of lucidity is the major objective in the development of the projector. Every projection causes a kind of shock to the consciousness which perturbs and confuses it. Emotionalism, euphoria, loss of lucidity, retention difficulties, incoherent interpretations, distorted perceptions and disparities in the observations of projectors occur due to this shock. For this reason, it is necessary to gradually minimise the shock to the consciousness until it is altogether eliminated. According to the laws of projectiology, the more natural, simple and physiological the process of pure projection is, the less will be the shock to the consciousness and the greater the possibility of reaching an advanced level of extraphysical lucidity. There are external agents that can provoke projection, such as chemicals, drugs, anaesthetics, gases, physical exhaustion, hypnosis, pressure on the cervical nerves, stimulus to the balance centres of the inner ear, illness, accidents and the inhibition of desires, i.e. hunger and thirst. These provoke an impure or artificial projection. They are all less than ideal because they disturb the attributes of the consciousness. They do not serve as routine, trustworthy systems with which one can acquire advanced extraphysical knowledge and perform high quality experiments. It is thus necessary to use natural methods, discarding attitudes of extreme technicism and mysticism, as well as maintaining one's perceptions in a way that produces consistent, worthwhile results. The increased sharpness of perception outside the soma demands discipline, practice and perseverance. 
This allows the projector to become used to the characteristics of the free psychosoma and the extra physical dimension, enabling mastery of one's own thoughts, emotions and energies. This will minimise the shock involved with projection, which will allow a better analysis of extraphysical events. I propose the inevitable neologism projectiology to name the field of consentiology that studies the group of phenomena and events that comprise the experiences outside the soma, or the projections of the consciousness utilising the psychosoma and mental soma. Chapter 10. In the Presence of Ephemeral Forms Prior to Projection Monday, July 30th, 1979 Third sleep at 3am After registering the debates on the extraphysical themes from the previous chapter Extraphysical Period I was fully lucid in an extra-physical institution where the helpers projected a live scene of myself at a younger age, my mother Aristina, now in extra-physical consciousness, and my son Arthur, prior to his current intraphysical life. In order to study it, I made an attempt to approach the very realistic images without success. The ephemeral forms dispersed just like vaporous plastic gauze, tissue or foam rubber. Arthur was a little boy in the image. He smiled when I asked him something that I cannot now recall, perhaps due to the emotion of the unexpected, unprecedented event. As the episode proceeded, my mother embraced me, speaking affectionately and placing an aura of love around the whole scene. It was curious that I found myself with black hair, wearing dark glasses and extra physical clothes, all of which were morphothocenes. It was also interesting to notice that this visual projection was not my creation, being composed of the morphothocenes of others. Had these images come from my mother? As I was thinking about it, I received an unmistakable mental confirmation that they had. The scene was from one of my projections. It had been the first extra-physical meeting with my mother since her death, an event I had not previously recalled. Before being reborn, Arthur spent some time at the same extra-physical educational institution as Tancredo, the friend referred to in Chapter 3 of this book. The institution is in Ascensal, located in a rural area of the city of Patrocinio, near the place where my mother passed away. This projection had occurred 12 years ago, eight years before Arthur was reborn and received that name, and in the same year of my mother's death. The integral memory records everything experienced by the consciousness from its inception forward, detail by detail, every fraction of a second. The archives of the consciousness, while not restricted by the soma, surpass the records of the cerebral cells. And, when necessary, recollections buried deeply in the integral memory come to the surface in their integral form, piercing through the veils of forgetfulness. During and after the brief visual projection, I maintained full awareness of the locale and perceived the presence of my mother beside me. As a result, we had a peaceful farewell. From the institution, I attempted a direct descent to the Earth's surface in order to geographically locate the area. This brought me right over a farm. From there, I floated over wires, a slightly bent rural electricity pole, and the tops of orange trees in a small orchard. After observing the scenery of the countryside, I thought of returning to the soma, which immediately occurred. After returning, the clock read 4.45am when I began to record the vivid memories of my mother's presence, as well as the impressive scenes from the projection, which came to me immediately in their entirety and yet gently. 
observations. The integral memory records facts in three distinct stages. The first involves a review of the scenes of events experienced during one's entire intraphysical life after the passage of physical death or the life review or recapitulation of memories. The second is of the projections that occur during sleep. The third includes all occurrences in the intervals between intraphysical lives, intermissive periods. The three characters in the projection described in this chapter were in the following conditions. My mother was presented as she had been when recently deceased. My son was shown as he was when preparing to be reborn. And the image of myself was taken from a projection that I had not remembered in 1967. In other words, the visual projection illustrated three distinct points. Everything that happens to the individual is forever recorded in the integral memory of the consciousness. Whether the events were experienced while in the intraphysical state, while separated from the soma during natural sleep, or while in the extraphysical condition before and after intraphysical rebirth. The integral memory can be consulted in whole or in part. Events that have occurred during any of the three conditions of the consciousness at any time can be shown in incredibly real form, whether in a fragmented or in block, intact fashion. It is a simple case of consulting the mnemonic memory centers of the principal consciousnesses involved in an important event in order to obtain complete and accurate details of the whole episode. Chapter 11 Visual Acuity Prior to Projection Thursday, August 2nd, 1979 Intense preliminary exercises were initiated at 8.29pm while standing up and then while sitting in bed. Upon lying down, I briefly lost lucidity. Then, I had a sharp internal mental vision of the extraphysical consciousness, Jose Grosso. I went to sleep at 9.21pm, quite relaxed, lying on the left side. Extraphysical period. I became lucid in the final stage of the psychosomas takeoff. I exited upwards and to the right. I was certain that I was fully aware outside the soma. The extraphysical environment was very dark, and this fact caught my attention. As I thought of dark surroundings, I began to see a bluish light. The change came not from the environment, but from the psychosoma. The artificial light that was emanating from isolated windows in houses and apartments on various floors of the surrounding buildings was stronger and clearer than the light that seemed to have appeared before me over the entire urban landscape as a result of my expanded visual perception. I saw a wide dirt road. I perceived an inner warning not to think about sex as there were extra-physical consciousnesses nearby with their minds fixed on the subject, seeking encounters. The most prominent features of the surrounding neighbourhood were a building under construction and another one about six storeys high, already completed and inhabited. When I focused on the six-storey building, the structures of the floors were visible to me, as well as the intimacy of the dwellings, as if each segment of the construction had become more clearly illuminated and more sharply focused. I could see that it was occupied. Another inner warning suggested that I should not invade the privacy of those living there. I could distinguish between apartments with residents and others without. With omnidirectional X-ray vision, I was seeing from a distance around every side and in all directions at once, as well as two or three floors at a time. It was as though the skeleton of the building was illuminated and inhabited, very much like a china cabinet. With my improved visual perception, I could see the foreground in perfect focus, as well as the insides of things without the influence of perspective. 
I think that this enhanced type of telescopic vision is dependent upon the density of the psychosoma, as well as the cosmoethics guiding the intentions of the individual. I do not know why, but I recalled blind projectors who see perfectly while in the extraphysical dimension. Concentrating on one specific area, I was able to locate extraphysical consciousnesses and persons passing by, far down the street. Some of them looked like acquaintances who were temporarily outside the soma. I could see both men and women on the sidewalk. There were only extraphysical consciousnesses on the dirt road. I examined the street, houses and pedestrians for several minutes with my visual perception that had been enhanced by the helpers. I saw no vehicles, nor could I identify the locale. As I went down the side street, I felt the irresistible call to return to the intraphysical base, location from which one projects oneself. After returning, it was 9.56pm. I had spent exactly 35 minutes out of the soma, which had continued to rest, lying on its left side. The recollections came spontaneously and naturally, as though the extraphysical events had simply been a common scene out of material life, recalled in the morning after a night of peaceful sleep. I immediately began to make note of the projection. Observations. During sleep and even during a projection, tight clothes causing reduced blood flow or a full bladder and certain positions in bed sometimes provoke the erection of the penis. This event, however, has no repercussion on the psychosoma. In other words, penile erection does not occur, in this case, in the extraphysical form. Sometimes, independent of the conditions of the human body, a latent desire or strong impulse to have intraphysical sex can occur during a projection. Such an event must be identified, analysed and tamed by the projector who truly desires to evolve and overcome his or her own deficiencies. Sexual desire constitutes energy that can be vampirized by ailing extraphysical consciousnesses who can think of nothing else and live for that objective alone. These ill extraphysical consciousnesses acquire our energy through mental assaults and extraphysical attacks on the planetary crust. A normalization of one's sexual life with a permanent partner constitutes the only natural or physiological solution to the problem. Maintaining a single satisfactory sex partner will serve to improve the projective processes of both. Sexual relationships between intraphysical and extraphysical consciousnesses, or sex while outside the body, is not the same as sex while in the physical body. Orgasm cannot occur in the extraphysical dimension. What happens is that energy is exchanged between the intraphysical and extraphysical partner, and the projector ends up losing far more energy than he or she gains, especially if the extraphysical sex partner is a psychotic post mortem. The extraphysical consciousness is perfectly capable of robbing the projector of their energies, and that is typically what happens. With this in mind, it becomes of prime importance that one's sex life, very much like one's nutritional needs, be satisfied naturally without any fixed ideas or sentiments of guilt. The projector needs to set aside all sexual conditioning and taboos and put his or her libido in second place. In this way, the projector is able to serenely perform other more important tasks in the extraphysical dimension. Sex is, more than anything, in the mind. The most important sexual organ is not between the legs, but between the ears. The taming of the mind constitutes the mastery of sex, and everything else. It is indispensable to know how to peacefully live with sex without placing too much value on it. Overrating sex undermines the fundamental elements of self-evolution. We attract one another through thocenes, in much the same way that a direct evocation attracts extra-physical consciousnesses in daily life, 
It also attracts individuals projected during sleep. A fixed thought of sex with a specific person has the power to summon that consciousness in certain circumstances while the soma is sleeping for the purpose of sexual exchanges. This often causes dreams and recollections of the extra-physical events. The above situation is commonly referred to as congressus subtilis. The closer the two beings are geographically, the easier it will be for the invisible union to take place. When one does not wish for the union, it will not take place, irrespective of the circumstances. It is necessary to always control one's ideas and aspirations in order to avoid undesirable approaches. Extraphysical sex can happen between intraphysical and extraphysical consciousnesses, having either masculine or feminine mentalities or tendencies, regardless of their intraphysical or extraphysical appearance. Our little venial sins, camouflaged weak points, predispose and trigger immature behaviour as well as serious conflicts. The projector must avoid any act that invades the privacy of intraphysical consciousnesses by restraining one's unhealthy curiosity and negative intentions. This will help to ensure one's conduct is moral and will maintain one's self-defence in relationships with others. It will also avoid the attraction of psychotic post-mortems who might be in the area, having been drawn to those individuals. These disturbed consciousnesses may feel that their privacy has been violated and might decide that they are justified in persecuting the projector, disturbing his or her intraphysical life and exits from the soma. Chapter 12 Jarvis and Orko Prior to projection, Sunday, August 5th, 1979. I went to bed at 8.09 p.m. in a physically tired and sleepy state. I had a clear, prolonged vision of Maria Clara and was making preparations for a different type of extraphysical excursion without receiving any details. For the projector who is being guided, the root of the projection is always a surprise. Intense energy emission exercises lasted until 8.36 p.m. I lay on the right side. Extraphysical period. I became lucid in the extraphysical dimension in front of the extraphysical consciousness, Maria Clara, who looked like an enchanting girl about nine years old with fluffy, neatly trimmed dark hair and the appearance and behavior of a very lively child. It was the Maria Clara I already knew, but changed. She was now undergoing preparations for her next intraphysical life. She explained that I would be making a visit on my own to an extraphysical consciousness called Orko, and that I should under no circumstances be frightened, but should maintain a serene trust in the extraphysical assistance that would be present the whole time, even if it was not always visible. After that, she offered me some brief thoughts about animals and men on earth, their tasks, evolution, and their raison d'etre as a preparation for this projection. The trip began in an extraphysical region bordering the surface of the planet. In a few moments, I noticed that the environment was not at all pleasant. In the dark atmosphere, the increasingly dense ambience gradually forced me to switch from flight to gliding, and finally from gliding to a slow walk, until I reached a semi-dark, deserted plain. The slender threads of light that emanated from the psychosoma suddenly disappeared. In the humid, heavy, cold environment, buffeted by freezing winds and unpleasant emanations, there was only one misty light hovering above me in the leaden sky. Vague forms passed by, like obscure shadows. Strange balls of energy swirled and appeared to explode here and there. The further I advanced, the denser the air became. It was similar to the intraphysical dimension on a moonless night. 
shadowy, roaming figures burst out of the darkness. They were indescribable, persistent morphothocines, some like swarms of huge, delirious hornets, quick, voracious persecutors that came from all directions and that, fortunately, were chased away as soon as they had appeared. After this, there was still a long way to go. I covered the distance in such a hurry that I could not examine the surroundings in detail. An extra physical consciousness having the appearance of a strong, upright man crossed our path. He gave me a mental explanation. Welcome, I am Jarvis. I will introduce Orko. I knew instantly that he was aware of where I came from and the purpose of my visit. As soon as I emitted my thought, an enormous, muscular, earthen-coloured mastiff, the size of a panther, having hair like a lion's mane and shining eyes that seemed human, only much more penetrating and disturbing, jumped in the middle of the winding path. He was growling with a resounding roar, like a very ferocious wolf. Sharp, pointed claws were protruding from his paws. He was a character who could impress even the most serene spectator. Jarvis made a gesture to calm him down and the hound retreated to one side, stood alert for a moment and then dove into the shadows in the direction from which he had come. The massive Jarvis made some observations regarding the tasks he performed with Orko. He affirmed that Orko was an extra-physical guardian and should not be considered to be a regular dog, but a more evolved being with subhuman intelligence, although endowed with powerful animal magnetism. Not uncommonly, such beings are referred to as elementals or assistants of nature. Irrespective of his designation, he was a consciousness in evolution, just like any other. He informed me that they were given many peacekeeping tasks and missions of rescue and assistance to ailing consciousnesses and those still in need of human resources in order to be enlightened and rehabilitated. These consciousnesses find themselves in this state as a result of their already compromised condition and their absorption of the pathological thocines of unaware persons on the planetary crust. Many other species of animals perform guardian duties according to their capabilities. He stressed that often, a person who manages to arrive at these extraphysical regions immediately returns to the soma shocked, in a state of terror and, upon initial contact with the brain, conjures incredibly elaborate nightmares of fights with monsters in implacable persecution. This is understandable since, if the surroundings and expression of Orko scare even experienced extraphysical consciousnesses having agile, lucid minds, what can be expected of persons with weak minds who are briefly projected out of the soma in a haphazard manner and sometimes without lucidity? Anyone who witnesses this can understand why these scenes can induce fantastic nightmares fantasies and mythological creations in the intraphysical mind. Duos like this must have inspired the formation of human guards, accompanied by dogs which perform search, rescue and policing services. At that point, I bid him a fraternal farewell. Jarvis remained with the abnegate mission of an incessant struggle on behalf of evolution in an area of intense consensual conflicts. How long has this extra-physical consciousness been working there? The departure from this ambience was less unpleasant than my arrival, and the return to the soma occurred swiftly. After returning, I checked the clock after returning to the soma, which was still on the right side, and made a mental note, 9.36pm. It seemed that I could still see Orko's unforgettable eyes shining in the semi-darkness of the bedroom as he advanced, growling. He stood out as the major personality in that extra-physical reality and was now deeply etched in my memory. My recollection of Orko caused an instantaneous and complete recall of the extra-physical occurrences. Observations One can never stop learning 
How many unknown life forms are there still to be studied? In the extra-physical dimension, we encounter more strange facts than on this planet. The psychosoma always gives off some light, ranging from dim to exuberant. Its brightness is dependent upon the evolutionary level and condition of a consciousness and its environment. A flow of harmonizing energy seemed to ring an inner bell, prompting me to register this projection. It is important to make a few observations regarding the sensations experienced with the energetic shower originating in the coronal chakra, crown chakra. The willful contraction of the cranial muscles, generally at a frequency higher than the pulse and faster than one per second, provokes energetic detoxification that can be tame or vigorous, slow or rapid. These exercises cause yawns and tearing of the eyes and work to relieve various indispositions. Sometimes the exercise reaches a peak of acceleration after which the contractions become less intense and slower until they disappear altogether, leaving in their place a vibration that provokes immense well-being. One's concentration and willpower cause the energetic shower. Strong, accentuated energy emissions will take place during this process, which can occur anywhere, anytime, or in any physical position, including in moving vehicles, as long as the circumstances allow a few minutes of isolation. During the course of the exercise, a thundering sound can occur inside the head which is characteristic of muscular contractions stronger than those used in yawning. This gives the sensation of having the head connected to a powerful, invisible apparatus. There is no question that the coronal chakra plays an important role in the process of energetic detoxification as it is positioned exactly at the top of the head, radiating upwards right in the middle of all the muscles that involve the cranium. The muscular contractions causes the moving of the eyebrows, forehead and the whole scalp, even reaching the ears. In my personal case, I am able to easily move my ears at will. Inspired by observations made while outside of the body, I have, through the years, used that type of energetic detoxification while I am taking a shower. This process generates a powerful hydromagnetic flow analogous to a localised, individual hydromagnetic storm and acts as a kind of preventative hydrotherapy. The water, set at a comfortable temperature, washes away the toxic energies as well as dense morphothocines, magnetically rinsing the physical body. It has a positive effect on the aura, the silver cord and even the psychosoma. I have often observed that, when there is food in the stomach, the energies stimulate digestion. Furthermore, energetic showers promote self-healing from ailments such as general physical indispositions, psychic fatigue, facial neuralgia, neck sprains and other minor afflictions. All these facts have been verified more than once. Those who are accustomed to the use of air conditioning in hot climates and are not overly sensitive to cold air can produce the same basic effect using an aeromagnetic refrigerating flow or, in other words, the emission of energies while standing approximately 3 feet in front of a 1 HP air conditioner installed close to the floor and set at a low temperature. This method produces indisputably positive effects. It is, however, not as efficient as the energetic action of the hydromagnetic shower described above. Both the hydromagnetic shower and aeromagnetic refrigeration produce various positive effects, which are explained in detail by projectiology. Chapter 13 Energies and Perceptions Prior to Projection Wednesday, August 8, 1979 Time, 
8.12 p.m. Phase of the moon, full at 12.22 a.m. Intensive energy emission exercises began immediately after assuming the dorsal position. I felt a rapid movement of the right hand. This was a repercussion of the sudden return of the extra-physical hand which had been partially disengaged and had then suddenly returned to a state of alignment with the physical hand. In semi-disengagement of the bodies, this phenomenon can be called self-telekinesis when, for example, the right arm is separated while the consciousness remains awake or semi-awake and one finger of the hand of the psychosoma touches the corresponding physical part without becoming realigned. When this occurs, there is a kind of harmless electric shock, quite strong and clearly perceptible, with a repercussion to the physical arm. During the semi-disengagement of the bodies prior to complete takeoff, the last part of the soma to be projected is the head. The soma became very numb as I turned onto the left side. I experienced a brief loss of consciousness and the clear image of the extra-physical consciousness, Jose Grosso, appeared. At 8.33 p.m., the energy movement exercises finished and I went to bed lying on the left side, wishing intensely to exit and float above the soma. Extra-physical period. After a brief period of sleep, I became fully conscious, even though I was still inside the soma. I was absolutely certain that, at that time, the psychosoma had not completely disengaged from the soma. After a short period of vibrations, I made a quick takeoff, experiencing a very pleasant sensation of freedom. I noticed the presence of several tenuous and yet vigorous filaments coming out of my back. The filaments seemed like the type of covered wires used by power and light companies in the encasements beneath sidewalks. They were components of the silver cord. My will to leave the soma seemed to produce a solid substance against which I pushed my psychosoma up and out using an extra physical arm and an extra physical hand. The will acts like a lever. A resonant thought of external origin perceived as though I was hearing non-articulated sounds, gave a brief, slow, metered message. What you think of will be created and will immediately appear. I thought about the Superman cape used by my son Arthur and a red cape appeared on my back. Looking at it during the quick flight, the cape seemed to flutter in the wind. I took a quick spin through the air and, after stopping, energy began to be emitted. It seemed that the intensive energy exercises performed before sleeping were continuing outside the soma. The energies emitted by the consciousness, together with the energy of nature, when accumulated before takeoff, assist the helpers to awaken one, to increase one's luminosity, and to sharpen the visual and auditory perceptions of the projector as soon as he or she leaves the soma. A feeling of indescribable wellness arose inside me as I glided for quite a while in the open air of Ipanema, near my apartment. The act of thinking constructively while outside the body provokes the spontaneous absorption of subtle energies from natural sources, such as the ocean and forests, and permits their immediate and effective utilisation. The rapid absorption of energy takes place in the same way as the reception of thoughts and suggestions from extra-physical consciousnesses. The resonant voice warned me, there will be a strong noise in the vicinity of your soma, which may retract the psychosoma. I heard the indefinable sound and immediately returned to the proximity of the soma. What kind of physical sound might that have been? I saw my inert soma lying on its left side. I turned to match that position and a complete alignment of the bodies occurred. I immediately wished to return to free flight. The inexpressible freedom of flying made me feel much better than being in the soma, but a resonant thought suggested that I write down this account. 
I realized that the forces that link the psychosoma to the soma are the same ones that cause the vibrational state. The attraction of the soma while in close proximity to it was almost irresistible. And then, the thought of writing finally won over my momentary indecision. There was no visible extraphysical consciousness nearby. The sensation of being in the psychosoma was still with me in the dense body. I suddenly had an idea. It would be a shame to turn on the light and disperse the accumulated energy. And so, upon getting up, I decided to write down the main points of the extraphysical events in the dark. After returning, the digital clock showed 9.36 p.m. I got up from the body to write some notes in the dim light of the office. I filled seven sheets of paper with spaced telegraphic phrases. As I returned to bed, I felt the general coldness of the soma. Observations The silver cord appears to be composed of a bundle of pulsating power cables rather than a single cord. The distensibility of the projector's energetic cord represents his projective power. Where is the physical attachment of the energetic cord when this appendage is retracted during landing and concealed within the soma? The process of translocating the consciousness can be instantaneous. One can pass through the thickest sorts of material structures, although everything changes in accordance with the extraphysical dimension that you find yourself in. The denser and darker the extraphysical atmosphere is, the slower will be the velocity of flight and the greater is the willpower required for the transit of the consciousness. Local differences influence whether flight will be fast and easy or difficult and slow according to one's will and the area's density. There are, due to the relative quality of thocines, thick atmospheres where flight is more difficult than on the planetary crust itself. The will is the propelling agent of flight. When it so desires, the consciousness can stroll like an ordinary person or it can stop in mid-air. In subtle atmospheres, flight can reach the speed of thought without the consciousness losing any lucidity. It is important to note that everything that alerts the physical mind affects projection. For this reason, it is necessary to take precautions with respect to the physical base, where the soma will rest, thus projecting the projector from negative surprises and avoiding, as much as possible, external sounds and events that might interrupt the projective process or cause an unexpected return of the psychosoma. Some especially disturbing sounds include doorbells, telephones, intercoms, pendulums, noisy clocks, pigeons on the windowsill, flushing toilets, sound equipment at high volume, nearby construction noises, the singing of birds, vehicles crossing over metal plates, a neighbourhood party, a faulty air conditioner, shaking of the floor, storms, howling winds and other natural occurrences. Background music in the projectarium the physical space tailored so as to maximise projectability is not advised. Chapter 14 Frustrated Visit Prior to Projection Tuesday, August 14th, 1979. Phase of the moon, last quarter at 4.03 p.m. I went to bed at 3.35 a.m. for my third sleep of the night, after writing for several minutes in the living room. I lay down in the dorsal position, the ideal position for projections. Extra physical period. I was completely awake as I respectfully entered the bedroom of R, my sister and very close friend in the state of miniature ice. I saw her sleeping peacefully, lying on her right side, 
with her psychosoma in alignment with her soma. She was my target person. The suggestion came for me to awaken her without moving her soma. In this way, a transmental telepathic dialogue would be possible. I placed my extra physical right hand on her left shoulder, which was facing up, and used a familiar nickname to call her. F. After employing a reasonable amount of mental force and determination with the intention of provoking her extra physical awakening, she sleepily looked upwards, seeking the direction of the call, trying to see who was bothering her. I seized the opportunity and gave a spontaneous explanation while taking great care not to frighten her. F, it's me, look. I'm outside of the Soma, which is in Rio de Janeiro. For an instant, after giving the impression of continuing to sleep, as if somnambulant, she seemed to open her eyes and emitted a thought. My God, is that you? What happened? I'm visiting. How are S and EJ? Her perturbation by my visit was much deeper than it appeared, with a serious, younger, brighter face looking fixedly at me she just repeated, horrified. No, no, please leave me. You must be a vampire. Since her emotional alteration was evident, I thought it better to leave her alone. The realignment of her bodies took place immediately and I transmitted energies to calm her. I went to the adjoining room, gliding through the house, Noticing the movement of my extra physical arms and legs and thinking, she thinks I am vampire, like Count Dracula. How difficult it is to make contact in these conditions. Me, a vampire? That's all I need. But her thoughts are not without reason, for they have the logic of fear. At that point, there was a noise inside the house, coming from one of the interior bedrooms. Had my sister awakened thinking that she had a nightmare? Or was another person in the house? I had the instinctive reaction to flee and seek out a place to hide, as if I had been engaged in a reprehensible activity and was about to be caught. My thoughts caused the psychosoma to levitate towards the ceiling. From there, I could see the light from the street coming in through the tall glass windows in the living room. I had assumed that position due to a compulsive and infantile reaction, thinking that I could perhaps remain hidden from anyone who walked in. I received an inner suggestion to return to the soma. After returning, as I peacefully awoke, the projection felt as natural as any common event of human life. So natural had the occurrence been that, in order to test the projection, I emitted a flow of energy and noticed that the soma felt heavy. In a few seconds, I received a shower of energy. I then confirmed the presence of a helper. As I consulted the clock, I made a mental note, 5.14 a.m. At that moment, before beginning to write, I intentionally began to recall all of the events I had observed while outside the soma especially the thought about Dracula, the strange and powerful personage of Count Rochester, written about by the well-known Russian psychic Wera Krijanowski, published in Brazil as the Hatasu Queen. It was now 7.28 a.m. After making a long-distance call, R explained that she had been awakened at some point during the night, but then had gone back to sleep at 4.30 a.m., when she heard the large clock in the house striking. She was somewhat indisposed as she was coming down with a cold. She did not dream, but said that she slept on her right side. She always sleeps on her side, never on her back. She also mentioned that yesterday they had talked a lot about matters regarding us in Rio de Janeiro. She confirmed that another relative in the house wakes from time to time through the night due to health problems and that the room has a window that was still open at that time, near a public lamppost on the street. 
She told me that she would be afraid to consciously see me outside of the soma. She had read the novel about Rochester a long time before and frequently works with the emission of energy, but has never seen an extraphysical consciousness and was afraid even to think about it. Observations It is not recommended that the projector try to reach another person, unduly intruding and meddling in their privacy without consent, except in extraordinary cases like this one based on family ties and with the intention of cooperating with lucid projectability. Chapter 15. Cleansing Projection Prior to Projection Wednesday, August 15th, 1979. An atypical day. Some duties and commitments required that I spend part of the afternoon and night with an amiable man I had recently met who lives outside Rio de Janeiro. The meeting had stretched out and the period of personal preparation for sleep kept me from going to bed until 10.15pm. The extra physical company that had come with the visitor had stayed, perhaps to receive some fraternal thoughts. I functioned once more as extra physical bait, a person to whom a sick extra physical consciousness has become attached for the purpose of being treated. Extra physical period. Soon after the takeoff of the psychosoma, confirming the observations made before sleeping, I became lucid among psychotic postmortems with considerable hypnotic power, wearing gloomy expressions, making threatening gestures, and forming a horde of truculent persecutors. Aware of the function for which I had been summoned, I began the treatment of these consciousnesses in the surroundings of my own apartment, with the purpose of pacifying those classified by projectiology as intruders. How difficult it is when you are obliged to defend yourself. The eight vigorous consciousnesses, having significant magnetic power, disorderly passions and a visible disposition to attack, insistently and implacably tried all they could to subjugate me. But in my case, being a lucid projector, and due to the intangible support of invisible helpers, their mental struggle became more arduous and evenly matched. Such consciousnesses always try to impede ongoing tasks and absorb the energies of those who make themselves available to them. The helpers had apparently left me alone as they sometimes supervise from a distance or are not perceived due to a difference in their frequency in the middle of this rebellious and desperate struggle. I have participated in this sort of contest innumerable times over a long period. The dense energies of the soma make it easier to contact extra-physical consciousnesses of a low and still very material vibratory composition. Fraternal dialogue, thoughts of peace, the interaction of the helpers and the maintenance of inner tranquility without the emission of negative thoughts, as always, constitute the best conduct while in the middle of a torrent of energetic emissions carrying insane blasphemies and improprieties. While outside the soma, very often I behave like a serene father and, on other occasions, like a teacher trying to explain a simple lesson. Only consensual authority, achieved through being a living example of what one says, allows us to have supremacy over sick extra-physical consciousnesses. Thus, cosmoethics are clearly intertwined with the process of projection. Sick individuals make up a large part of the extra-physical population and are a burden to this school-hospital planet. Malicious, defiant or threatening extra-physical consciousnesses only dominate those who let themselves be dominated. The cleansing projection is one of the greatest opportunities for the projector to make himself or herself useful. Consensual authority always prevails in a high-quality projection. 
after a certain period of energetic confrontation, there was an increase in the pressure from the extraphysical group, with a larger number of psychotic postmortems in bad mental condition having been attracted by the defection of some of their companions who had been guided away peacefully. My mother Aristina, an extraphysical consciousness who was seen only by myself and not by the sick consciousnesses, advised me to return temporarily to the soma in order for the atmosphere to clear up a little. The intentional landing was executed with some energetic effort, since I was the target of many concentrated and imbalanced thoughts. After returning. As I awoke, I could still feel traces of the presence of the psychotic postmortems. My dense soma seemed like a fortress or trench, allowing a truce in the struggle that would go on into the night in favour of the betterment of all concerned. As I began this entry, the clock read 11.56 p.m. Observations The first energetic demand of this type occurred with me in adolescence. It resulted from my interaction with extraphysical intruders, malicious extraphysical consciousnesses, who were connected with a family member. Such mind-to-mind -mind battles have always been consensual and were this way before my current intraphysical life. They will probably be so after the deactivation of my soma. The cleansing projection requires maxi fraternity, the only resource capable of causing a great revitalization, calming those who challenge extraphysical realities in order to subjugate unwary consciousnesses, inflicting torturous suffering. Projection is perhaps the activity best suited for the self cleansing of any paranormal person. I suppose that extraphysical cleansing is not possible when utilizing the mental soma alone. During the performance of cleansing tasks, the psychosoma is always present and sometimes in a denser state in order to facilitate contact with sick extraphysical consciousnesses. When the psychosoma is within the extraphysical sphere of energy, an area of dense energy extending approximately 13 feet in all directions from the head of the individual, it has greater energetic resources available to exteriorize, offering a better defense against extraphysical attacks. As incredible as it may sound, some researchers preach that projection has latent dangers and malignant side effects such as unbearable sensations, fainting spells, nightmares, hallucinations, emotional disturbances, hypochondria, hysteria, dizziness, migraines, panic, severe amnesia, psychic trauma, disintegration of the psyche, paralysis, cardiac arrest, aneurysm, and rupture of a blood vessel, cerebral hemorrhage, morbid non-alignment of the bodies, pathological disturbances of the psychosoma, twisting or rupture of the silver cord, confused aura, violent repercussions, stigmatization, alienation from family and friends, harmful extraphysical encounters, encounters with hostile beings, accidents with the soma, intrusion, possession, death from a knife wound, occupation of the soma by an extraphysical consciousness, premature burial and physical death. Frankly, I think that these risks are greatly exaggerated and were created in part for the purpose of the intentional and systematic suppression of information about paranormal practices from ancient times, through the Middle Ages and lasting up until a few decades ago. I have never identified any of these reported inconveniences as a real obstacle to projection. The obstacles that I have encountered have only contributed to the technical perfection of the projective processes, which have brought me great happiness. I find that good intentions, inner peace, constructive self-criticism, discernment, and a somewhat developed projectability will naturally remove these and other perhaps supervening risks in some phase of the development of projection. I do not see the need for any serious restriction of the practice of projection,
as long as ordinary precautions are observed with respect to physical and mental hygiene. Chapter 16 – Social Reception Prior to Projection Sunday, August 19, 1979 I went to bed at 10.11pm. After more than one hour of preliminary energetic exercises, including the application of energy to my head, especially my eyes, I lay down to sleep on the right side. Extra physical period. I became vividly lucid during a classic, upwards, vertical takeoff of the psychosoma while passing through the wall of my bedroom in the direction of Visconji de Piraja Street to the south. While on the street, I saw the interior of a modern residence at a distance with a clear, telescopic vision, as though I were using a pair of zoom lenses. In the background, a distinguished-looking lady attended to a little girl of school age, wearing a nightgown and affectionately led her to bed. As I observed the intimate scene, I simultaneously saw other parts of the ample house, including a spacious living room where some sort of social reception was being held. The men and women in gala attire were moving about the room like actors on a stage, allowing me to perfectly distinguish between them and the equal number of shabbily dressed extraphysical consciousnesses of varied appearance. I noticed various well-groomed persons, some with grey hair. The majority were enjoying themselves as though they were at a party. The sounds of soft music could be heard coming from the inner rooms of the dwelling. In no time I entered the living room accompanying an extra-physical consciousness who gently approached another of masculine appearance, looking about forty, having a goiter that enlarged the shape of his neck, giving him a disproportionate look as though his neck and head were bigger than the rest of his humanoid constitution. My recollection of the mental dialogue is that the extra-physical consciousness refused to accompany the helper, vehemently expressing the need to stay there to transmit an important monologue to a certain person at the reception. He was, however, fraternally dissuaded from doing so. The brief, but incisive mental dialogue involved the intercession of some extra-physical consciousnesses who were present, companions of the insistent one. After some time, he gave up, and the helper led him out of the quarters, along with two others who were in the house. At that point, I received a suggestion to return to the soma. I noticed a marked difference between the clothes of the groomed and well-dressed men and women participating in the reception and the strange apparel of the extra-physical consciousnesses also present. Two of the extra-physical consciousnesses tried to approach me upon detecting my presence as a lucid projector, but were chased away by the helper, who was seen and apparently respected by all of them. The persons in the room were oblivious to the intangible scenes that were transpiring under the roof of the house, as well as the presence of a projected person whose soma was sleeping at that time. It was not possible for me to determine the locale. After returning. Upon awakening in the soma, lying on the right side, I looked at the clock, 10.56pm. The events of the projection were so vivid in my mind that they still seemed to be going on before my eyes, especially the colourful vision of the occurrences from a distance, the rescue of the psychotic post-mortem and the monologue he insisted upon transmitting at any cost. Would this have been a channelled monologue? I got up to write the entry in order to keep the diary of projections up to date. Chapter 17 – Luminous Tombstones Prior to Projection Thursday, August 23, 1979 Third sleep at 3.29am I laid down on the left side after having been up writing during the night. 
Extra physical period. My extra physical awakening took place over a hill, giving me the sensation of being left in mid-air, flying under the control of my own will. I felt a deep satisfaction in flying like a birdman without a hang glider. I noticed that it was still night and, while flying downwards in a circle over the hill, I thought of looking at my hands in order to remember having done so upon awakening. I clapped them together, allowing me to see them, light and loaded with energy, as if they contained electricity. The sensation of moving my hands was pleasant. Suddenly, the luminosity of some bright and pretty objects on the ground caught my attention as I was coming from the side of the hill. As I descended to observe the objects more closely, their brightness increased and it was possible to identify a luminescence emanating from several tombstones. I was in a cemetery. Upon making this discovery, I had the idea of grabbing one of the ornamental pieces from a tomb a small reclining angel that glowed like a light bulb. As soon as I thought it, the action took place. I fully experienced the sensation of feeling the object and receiving its luminescence like stardust in my hands. Finding the luminous radiation strange, an intuitive explanation came from deep within me. This was the accumulation of thocines generated by the loved ones of the person whose soma was buried there. A similar thing occurs with images in religious temples, which seem to acquire life from the intense energy imparted to them through the prayers of the faithful over time. There are also monuments and certain statues of famous persons, whose veneration by the people transforms the objects into images similar to those in the temples, due to the positive emanations which turn into luminous energy. The essence of everything in life is thought emotion and energy. What we think with passion we materialize and impregnate with life by emitting energy. The tomb, almost always an expression of human vanity, can be transformed into a repository of living forces which is what was seen on the stones of the cemetery. My hands seem to attract the luminescence of the object like a magnet attracting slivers of iron which I could touch and feel. It naturally occurred to me to compare the cemetery to a vast deposit of scrap iron. As I floated up and away from the tombs, I saw several extra-physical consciousnesses circling a grave in a distant row. The consciousnesses I saw from a distance seemed to be working with other psychotic post-mortems, assisting those who were unconsciously still tied down to their tombs and the general area of the cemetery. There were no extra physical consciousnesses near the luminous tombstones. Something within me suggested that I not approach the area as it was already time to return. After returning, as soon as I awoke, I checked the clock, 4.14 a.m. Fragmented memories began to flow into my mind. First, the last scenes of the projection, then the luminous tombstones, and, finally, the exercise of clapping my hands while flying, which provoked once again the sensation of well-being until I made this entry. Observations The state of having the inner perceptions, intuitions, premonitions, inspirations, or incontestable awareness of certain facts experienced by the consciousness liberated while outside the soma represents impressive phenomena associated with projection. The projector is not concerned with their occurrence, but, with repeated experiences, confidence in these processes arises, and one starts to apply them rationally in extra-physical activities. It is important to stress that this condition of inner certainty with respect to the details of a fact, the mental identification of a consciousness, or the clarification regarding a certain circumstance, comes immediately and does not always represent the simple inspiration of the helpers, but the natural perception of the projected consciousness, a new sensorial door, superior and incomprehensible to the finite mind of the dense physical brain. Comes immediately and does not always represent the simple inspiration of the helpers, but the natural perception of the projected consciousness, a new sensorial door, 
superior and incomprehensible to the finite mind of the dense physical brain. Chapter 18 Operation Interchange Prior to Projection Tuesday, August 28, 1979 An atypical workday I had been in the city of Niteroi for a few hours after 20 minutes of recuperative exercises, I went to bed at 7.55 p.m. in a physically tired state. Second sleep of the night without checking the clock. I laid on the left side. Extra physical period. I awakened in the extra physical dimension as I was entering an institution of multidimensional studies on a small deserted island. I was among various persons projected outside the soma assisted by a team of helpers, all led by an instructor. The projected persons were congregated as they arrived, each one accompanied by an extra-physical consciousness. They were treated with energies in the area of the head, in order to increase their lucidity and improve their reasoning capacities, thus facilitating more precise recollections after the extra-physical excursion. The place, managed by a sizeable team, functioned as an improvised establishment, but possessed authentic educational resources, as in universities on Earth. According to explanations provided at the time, everything possible had been done to make the recent arrivals feel at home. This would predispose their enhanced lucidity while outside the soma, which would allow the assimilation and later recollection of extra-physical events in a somewhat integral form, generally in the form of intuition or dreams. The operation was performed on an island in order to facilitate the transportation of the projected persons, as well as the consolidation of the extra-physical defences of the environment. I could see that the area was completely isolated by light strips, creating a campus in the wild environment, among the trees and over the rocks of the island. In the installation there were desks placed in rows, pictures on a wall, a simple podium at an elevated point, and a place like a screen for projecting visual images situated directly in front of the seminar leader. There must have been more than four dozen projected men and women, including some youths, authorities, public servants, teachers, medical staff, and participants belonging to various religious groups. Some knew each other and formed small groups. As they began the exposition of what they called Operation Interchange, a series of luminous three-dimensional maps and graphs of a determined area was shown each one dealing with a particular aspect of human life, and all dealing with the same geographical area, which seemed to be a particular neighbourhood of the city. Then, short lectures were given by three different extra-physical consciousnesses, developing the purpose of the meeting. They explained that, after small consecutive classes, an instructor would listen to the opinion of each of the persons who were temporarily liberated through physical sleep. The work entailed quick and intensive preparation for extra-physical assistance in a particular area of the city that the participating persons were from, each one currently living in the area under study and possessing a different knowledge and responsibility. They informed me that similar teams are common in the extra-physical world, scattered throughout almost all countries on various continents. Out of these programs have come the ideas that have inspired intelligent assistance along the lines of Operation Rondon, conducted in Brazil, Operation Cleanup, undertaken in slums, and other related undertakings in which hundreds of residents of specific zones are assisted by all available emergency resources. 
In this case, the participants of the educational activity were being brought together to enact a broad collective task of extra-physical cleansing, with the hope of improving the condition of, and even, in some cases, rescuing intra-physical and extra-physical consciousnesses. The hosts of the event stated that the cleansing being done is still very elementary in view of the real needs of those being assisted. These consciousnesses live in situations of group and reciprocal energetic parasitism, wherein extra-physical consciousnesses try to force temporary, artificial, semi-physical lives and transmit pathological energy emissions through processes of intrusion and energetic drainage of their intra-physical hosts. The presentations were very intelligent. They dealt with the issues of family and community life and sought to introduce simple, renovating concepts related to all aspects of human existence in a very natural and friendly way, free of mysticism or prejudice. They were presented in the manner of university students at ease on campus. The basic concept of cosmoethics stood out in all subjects addressed and was discussed in an impartial, universal way uniting consciousnesses of all backgrounds, ideologies and religious beliefs. A great range of topics was covered, including domestic life, work, transportation, health, leisure, school and survival. All of them, however, converged on the same point, the coexistence of intraphysical and extraphysical consciousnesses in homes and community centres such as clubs, associations, large and medium-sized companies, fitness classes and meetings of various types including religious, political and union gatherings. The themes of discussion brought to mind in a general way the clean-ups performed by police, the collection of vagrants before public celebrations and preparation of public places for inaugurations or solemn acts commemorating important community events. After informal, unspoken explanations were instantaneously transmitted, the instructor arrived. He was a luminous, radiantly pleasant extra-physical consciousness, who presented the final part and conclusion, beginning by questioning each one of those present about the operation and listening to their suggestions. The majority remained awake and answered the questions, effectively participating in the meeting giving opinions and making suggestions. Some of them, however, including two projected men and a projected woman, fell into a continuous sleep and were not able to participate in the mental dialogues. They were isolated before being returned to their physical bodies, an event that occurred simultaneously for dozens of projected consciousnesses who left in a single cluster at the end of the meeting with a prognosis of peace. The meeting served as proof to those present of the efforts and abnegation of the extra-physical consciousnesses assisting men and women throughout the earth. These helpers work to improve the conditions of life for those persons on the path of self-improvement, increased fraternity, deep community spirit and a greater sense of humanity. What a great deal of work still awaits those who are open to fraternal participation. At first sight, the tasks appear to be performed by veterans who are dealing with complete novices, but a joint effort is always fruitful and that is what they emphasised. The sketchy ideas in the unconscious end up germinating in the more capable minds in the community as vague intuitions and inspirations of imprecise origin which are then implemented in daily life. These ideas often appear to be rough parodies from an extra-physical perspective, but are perceived to be legitimate and practically spontaneous by those receiving the information. Upon leaving the locale, the islet seemed to me to be covered by luminous signs, taking on the qualities of a majestic, pyrotechnic spectacle, the entire oblong hill being covered with sparkling lights. After returning, when I awoke in the soma, the clock read 13 minutes past midnight. How long had the meeting lasted? It is difficult to know precisely. Observations Time outside the soma is always an enigma, 
a mysterious and perplexing dimension, becoming quite relative and even seeming to stop at times. Time is an intraphysical tool of measurement. With physical death, only time and the soma die. Those who experience biological death according to their condition and the extra physical body used, live without a future or within a space-time continuum, if they wish. Following are some basic differences between dreams and projections. 1. Ordinary mental activity is experienced in a dream. In a projection, mental activity can transcend the richness of the waking state. 2. During the dream state, one's reasoning capacity is diminished. In a projection, the intellectual capacity is equal to and commonly surpasses that which is available to us in the ordinary waking state. 3. In a dream, a person maintains the role of a passive spectator of events. In a projection, the projector takes an active role in unfolding events and has decision-making abilities equal to those of waking life. 4. In a dream, one accepts as natural the most absurd occurrences through lack of lucidity. In a conscious projection, critical judgment is always operative. 5. In a dream, one does not maintain a sequential memory of images. The lucid projector can remember events of a projection in their entirety down to the smallest details. 6. A self-hypnotic suggestion will not affect the coordination of dream events and images. The same suggestion can have an influence on extra-physical events. 7. One does not begin dreaming in the waking state. In a projection, it is possible to maintain lucidity before, during and after the projective process. 8. In a dream, there is no impression of a takeoff from the soma. In a conscious projection, the takeoff experience is fascinating and unique. 9. It is very difficult to prolong a dream. It is possible to prolong the stay outside the soma. 10. In a dream, sensory excitement results in the production of fantasies. In a conscious projection, touching the immobilized soma, even lightly, causes the return of the psychosoma to the soma, with the unmistakable sensation of the traction of the silver cord. 11. A dream does not include the collection of psychological and extra-physical factors common to projection, such as the high degree of lucidity, the sensation of freedom and well-being, mental clarity, expansion of capacities, gliding, flight and, sometimes, even euphoria. 12. In a dream, images are deformed and unreal. In a conscious projection, images do not become deformed. 13. In a dream, images are weaker than those perceived while in the waking state. In a conscious projection, they reach the highest intensity of any state of consciousness. 14. Dreams, although having weaker images, are easier to remember as they occur in a state of consciousness in which the psychosoma is either almost in alignment with or is at least in proximity with the soma. A conscious projection, while its images are more intense, is more difficult to remember, as projection occurs at a distance from the soma and thus is not directly influenced by the physical brain. This is one of the most noticeable paradoxes of projection. The more prolonged and distant the excursion of the psychosoma or the mental soma, the more difficult it will be to remember. Chapter 19 The New Extraphysical Consciousness Prior to Projection Tuesday, September 4th 1979. Third sleep at 3.55 a.m. I laid down on the right side. Extraphysical period. I became lucid in an extraphysical institution with a very pleasant environment, whose interior, being some 20 feet high, with broad doors and windows, was worthy of note. 
Various groups of extra-physical consciousnesses were situated in comfortable places, and in one of the delightful large halls, some of them were stretched out on beds. My attention turned to a kind, young-looking, sexagenarian, bold male with a deep wrinkle of attention between his eyebrows. He was settled on a bed next to another male of advanced age, who was at the head of his bed. I received a mental explanation that this had been his father. The sexagenarian had recently become an extra-physical consciousness, had passed through biological death, and was already aware of his situation, according to the mental transmission that occurred between the two. The light complexion of the extra-physical novice was glowing with happiness and euphoria, contained only now and then by the father, who was trying to make him comfortable in bed by laying him back against a voluminous pile of pillows. My presence was not noticed by them, as they had just met and were enthusiastically catching up on things, as one would expect from two relatives seeing each other after a longer absence. I asked myself if I was projected in the mental soma. The newly arrived extra-physical consciousnesses seemed to be in excellent condition, as indicated by the satisfaction evidenced in the meeting. I was trying to understand the exceptional height of the institution's interior space. Could it serve to calm the recent arrivals from terrestrial life, illustrating the insignificance of the intraphysical dimension compared to extraphysical greatness? Or was it a result of my extraphysical visual perception? At this point, I saw another extraphysical consciousness, an ecstatic male who had entered the quarters through one of the wide side doors, having come to welcome the recent arrival. Concentrating all my attention, I clearly noticed that the extra-physical consciousness emitted a barrage of affectionate and absurd swear words in his transmental dialogue, out of habit from terrestrial life. The two joyfully celebrated the visit, as both had perhaps previously done during their intra-physical existence. With a juvenile excitement reigning over the reunion, they embraced exuberantly, expressing jubilation and mutual declarations of friendship under the calm observation of the father at the bedside. I began to reflect on the spontaneity of the scene, the loving, seemingly boundless outpouring of so many audible swear words in that elevated environment, the authenticity of the extraphysical consciousness's behaviour and its consistency with their previous intraphysical lives. Thoughts and acts occur simultaneously in the extraphysical dimension. Returning to the immediate vicinity of the soma, I unexpectedly experienced an unpleasant sensation. The realignment of the psychosoma with the soma then occurred within a few seconds. After returning, I immediately opened my eyes and found the cause of the discomfort and subsequent call to return to the soma. The right arm had been in an uncomfortable position, resulting in poor blood circulation. After trying for a few minutes to improve the circulation in my arm, I checked the clock. It was 4.49 a.m. It was getting brighter outside and I could hear some birds chirping. Observations The mental soma can act isolated and independent of the psychosoma. We consider that the intraphysical consciousness has a set of bodies, holosoma, composed of the soma, holo chakra, the psychosoma, and the mental soma. In addition, the consciousness can project a portion of the holo chakra. The consciousness also presents the energetic connections of the silver cord and golden cord. I consider the other bodies mentioned in the ancient texts and theosophy to be referring to different states of consciousness. It is interesting to note that, even though I had indeed been projected in the mental soma, having left the psychosoma inside the human body, I had experienced projective repercussions from the physiological problem of poor circulation in the right arm. An extra-physical consciousness of average evolutionary stature, when asleep in the extra-physical dimension, 
leaves the psychosoma at rest and visits other dimensions using only the mental soma. Such actions constitute their mental projections, lucid dreams and lucid projections. To a certain extent, the advanced projector can do the same. He or she can extract the psychosoma from the soma, leaving the psychosoma at rest in the extraphysical dimension and then project from there using the mental soma as if he or she were an extraphysical consciousness. In this way, the projector has the advantage of maximizing his perceptions while outside the intraphysical dimension. Is it not strange that the consciousness is capable of temporarily maintaining two inanimate vehicles simultaneously? The mental soma, beyond being the seat of the consciousness, shows itself to be a more flexible and efficient vehicle than the psychosoma for the transport of the consciousness. Chapter 20 Hydromagnetic Storm Prior to Projection Thursday, September 6th, 1979 Phase of the Moon Full at 8pm I went to bed at 8.08pm upon sensing the presence of some extra-physical consciousnesses that were in attendance for the night's tasks. The ambient temperature must have been about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. I laid down in the dorsal position with a pillow under the right knee, another under the left arm, and a thin bedspread and blanket pulled up to my chin. No energy exercises occurred. There was only time for some brief concentration and communication with the helpers. Extra physical period. I experienced an immediate projection and fully awoke in the company of two extra physical consciousnesses who were friends of mine. One of the helpers was Aura Celeste, a benefactor and highly evolved companion. The helpers immediately informed me that the purpose of this trip was to retrieve a sick female extra-physical consciousness. After travelling rapidly for a few minutes, we arrived at a deserted coastline of the continent being battered by a mighty storm of lightning flashes, thunder clashes and heavy showers in foamy swirls. The storm seemed at that moment to be at its peak. The helpers informed me that as well as there being a physical tempest, there was a torrential rain of magnetic energy falling that emanated from the higher spheres in that region. This energetic storm was aimed at the periodic cleansing of dense morphothocenes in the subterranean caverns. The storm was like a massive earthquake and seaquake combined, stirring up immense waves, heaving up the soil and shaking the structures of the whole scene. The caverns began to get inundated by underground rivers, forcing the evacuation of resident animals, including rats running from their dens, fleeing sea otters, and eyes shimmering in the darkness, and bats darting wildly through the air. All were in a panic trying to escape through the numerous caverns, precipices, and gashes that penetrated the depths of the torrential mass. We glided over the elements, using our maximum level of deep inner forces in order to float over the hordes of animals and through the swarms of bats. The icy environment in the fume-filled caverns disclosed a magnificent and horrid beauty surpassing any nightmare. Between the colours of the jagged rock walls and the static majesty of the stalactites and stalagmites, Numerous bands of suffering extra-physical consciousnesses, mentally alienated, without human bodies, but still extremely dense and filling the magnetic effects of the tempestuous convulsions of the elements, ran horrified through the natural labyrinths in a depressing and terrifying save-yourself state. The enclosures of the caverns seemed transformed into catacombs of horror, 
Anguished dread showed in the appearances and gestures of the unfortunates who were gathering wherever they could. Disturbed, often dumbfounded, and sometimes shaking extra physical consciousnesses desperately sought support amongst themselves. A deep, spontaneous compassion arose in all of us witnessing the unforgettable scenes. We tried to remain floating in the difficult position of impotent spectators before the realism of the programmed catastrophe. We controlled our emotions and stifled our impulse to weep convulsively. Sections of the suspended geological elements shook loose and plummeted into the swirling waters of the spacious grottoes that had sheltered a considerable extraphysical population. The extraphysical consciousnesses were now floating in the mixed rain and sea waters, having emerged from hidden dungeons and prison cell-like mud holes that were tucked away in concealed places, in one of the worst atmospheres imaginable. Waves of small luminescent teams of extraphysical consciousnesses, agents of the consolation task, were arriving to perform works of fraternal assistance during and after the hydromagnetic storm. As the last effects of the storm passed, the helpers took advantage of a period of calmness to make an approach. Upon finding the small, sick female they were looking for, they took her with unsurpassable zeal from one of the indescribable refuge situated in the perennial shadows of the most twisted recesses of deeply entrenched gutters, gorges and trowels. The deformed, squalid creature gave the impression of mental deficiency immersed in a dark night of idiocy behind glassy eyes. She was totally oblivious to the storm's occurrence, as if living in her own world of endless nightmare. As a projector, I functioned as a common donor of energies. A teeny group of unbalanced extraphysical consciousnesses tried to prevent the rescue of the sick little female who was now sleeping. This group of detractors was dissuaded by the energetic defences established with the Thossines of the rescue team. During the last phase of the rescue mission, when I was leaving the locale, together with the two helpers and the extraphysical child, loud complaints and protests could be heard from the horrid extraphysical consciousnesses who remained and were beginning to celebrate the end of the storm in a bizarre orgy, loudly reciting pornographic verses by Pokaji. Our departure from that environment after the storm was quick and easy. One of the extra-physical companions with exuberant goodwill took charge of the sick little female. It was time to return to the Soma. After returning. Upon awakening, still with the vivid images of the storm, the rats the otters and bats, my brain translated the faint echoes of the inexpressible sensations I had experienced only moments before. The soma was still in the same peaceful dorsal position. I checked the clock. It was 9.51pm. The projection had lasted one hour and 40 minutes. I felt a powerful energy and the extra-physical consciousness, Aura Celeste, arrived. I vocally channeled her fraternal instructions to my wife, who had just entered the room to sleep. After the message was delivered, I began to write this entry in the office of the apartment. The weather in Ipanema was still good. <laughs>